search the world But it couldn't fill me Man's empty praise Treasures that fade Are never enough Then you came along And put me back together Just continuing with our theme on worship. So tonight I actually want to talk about enjoying God. Enjoying God. Uh, the Westminster Shorter Catechism. Now that sounds interesting, doesn't it? That's a document that's been around since I think around the 1600s, 1700s. And it was used in Presbyterian churches, the Reformed churches and other churches as a way of teaching children. And what they would do is they'd get a major doctrine, they'd shorten it so that kids could understand it, and they'd do it in question and answer form. So there's a whole bunch of beliefs. You know how we have a statement of belief uh, in our church, and, and you, know, you can see that on our website, and all churches have those statements of belief that define what we believe. I was actually talking to Brenda before, and we were talking about somebody who's into all sorts of weird stuff that they think is Christianity but it's not, right? 
sort of spiritualism and all these other things and and how and it just reminds me how important it is to know what the foundational beliefs are. So the Westminster Catechism, shorter catechism, is question and answers in a in a short way. And the first question is, what is the chief end of man? And of course, written in those days, um, it was written in the masculine, so you must forgive that. So they could have just said, what's the chief end of humans or people or whatever. But what is the chief end of man? What is the purpose of humanity? And the answer is simply this, to glorify God and enjoy him forever. To glorify God and enjoy him forever. So I don't know how you feel about the concept of enjoying God. I think sometimes that's a bit hard to grasp. We know Jesus saved us and we know that he loves us and yes, we do have a heart for God, but to actually enjoy him, what does that mean? And I actually think that Roger really hit on it tonight when he talked about our fellowship with God, the place of communion with God. And we look at Jesus' life and we see how he walked with the Father each day. He knew that God was with him, God his Father was with him. But then he drew aside and he spent time alone with God. And I think there, right there is a real key in learning how to enjoy God. And it's in those intimate times of prayer and just you and God, just you alone with God that, that we, we, we develop a, an intimacy, as Roger used that word, and, and a closeness and, and, and a growing understanding of the love of God for us and how much he treasures us. Because when we grasp that, that he indeed loves us and that he treasures us, we begin to love and treasure him, right? And even we see that in, the, in, in John's letters that, you know, we love because God first loved us. And isn't it true with parents and children that a child learns to love? Why? Because their parents love them. And when kids miss out on that, it's a tragedy, isn't it? And we've all uh, had imperfect parents, right? And, and so, you know, we, we, we're not great at loving because humanity has fallen and, and we struggle to love. And we'll talk about this a little bit more in a moment. But when it comes to our relationship with God, we have a God who is perfectly loving. You know, we, we know the attributes of God, like he's all knowing, omniscient. He's all powerful, omnipotent. What are the other ones, Roger? omnipresent. He's everywhere. But you know what? He's all loving. The Bible says God is love. Turn to the person next to you or shout across the room, God is love. And I've got this hunch that we can learn to enjoy God because he enjoys us. <laughs> Would you imagine that, that God actually enjoys you? Now, that might be linked to how you view yourself because if you've got a down look on your, uh, you know, you're looking down on yourself, then you don't think you're, uh, you know, that, not that good and you're not that great. Of course, we don't, have a puff, we don't want to have a puffed up attitude towards ourselves, do we? We don't think we're much. But you know, God thinks you're pretty neat. That's why Jesus went to the cross because he thought you were so precious and valuable, even in your fallenness, that he paid the highest price to get you back in his family because he wanted you to know his love and he wanted you to know that he enjoys you. When you wake up in the morning, he's looking forward to being with you. <laughs> Do we think about that in our relationship with God? He thinks you're pretty cool. I can tell you another reason why I know that because there's no other Glenda Richardson like Glenda Richardson. In fact, there's no other Glenda Richardson. There's only one. There's only one Debbie Cowell. There's only one Tony. There's only one Roger. There's only one Greg. And some of you are saying, praise God for that. <laughs> you have unique thumbprints, fingerprints. You have new -yeek, new -yeek, new -yeek? <laughs> unique eyes. There's no other eye like you. That's why they have eye recognition on computers because it's fail-proof. You are completely unique and God thought you up 
before the foundation of the world and he said, now let's look at history. When would, when, when would it be a good time for Steve to... <laughs> when does the world need a great drummer? <laughs> when does the world need a Steve Pounceet? See, we devalue ourselves so much. And it gives us the wrong view of ourselves. Now, there's a balance to this because we know that we were born into sin. We know that we are fallen creatures. And there's good in us and there's not good in us. (laughs) Because we ate of the tree of the knowledge of what? Good and evil. And, 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 And I want to ask you tonight, Up front, we're going to get onto this in a minute, hopefully. I haven't even started the sermon yet, by the way. How many hours have you got tonight? What was the first thing that Adam and Eve did, or Adam did? Both of them did it, actually. But what what was the first thing they did when they rebelled against God? They hid from him. We've been hiding ever since. And what was the first question that God asked Adam? What was the question? Adam, where are you? Now, was it that God lost Adam? Or was it that Adam lost God? And, and I think God asked Adam for that because, about that because that, that is a question that's ringing through history. Adam, where are you? And the answer is we're lost. Adam felt lost. He felt confused. He felt shame. He was down on himself. And we come to God with that. And if we're honest about that and we bring our broken selves to God and we say, God, I'm a sinner. And if we ask forgiveness for our sins, we know that Jesus paid the price for our sins and can be forgiven and we receive forgiveness. Then the next step is to enter into who God has made us to be in Christ. He makes us a new creature in Christ. He makes us a born again person. He makes us the very righteousness of God in Christ. In other words, we have right standing with him now. No shame, no guilt. No separation. We come into a common union with God. And why is that? So we could be religious? So that we could do what's right? (laughs) Well, yes, we do what's right in God's eyes. But as one famous preacher said, God didn't come to make bad people good. He came to make dead people alive. (laughs) And uh, that's good news. (laughs) Alive to God, alive spiritually, born again, forever, hallelujah. Tony, you're going to live forever, mate, in the presence of God and in his new creation, hallelujah. And so as we think about ourselves and we think about what Jesus did for us on the cross, we see Jesus is the bridge between us and a holy God and he restores us to right relationship and then we're seated with Christ in the heavenly realms. That's a place of acceptance. That's a place of royalty. That's a place of... Um, where we, we come into the inheritance that Jesus won for us on the cross. The, the Bible says we're heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ. Amen? Amen? Everything that Jesus won on the cross is yours tonight, including a sweet union with our loving Heavenly Father so that we can enjoy Him and that He can enjoy us forever. Hallelujah. That was the introduction. But I think we struggle with this concept of enjoying God. It's difficult and problematic for a few reasons. Firstly, we don't see God. If you go down, go up to Coles and walk up to somebody and say, have you seen God today? They'll ring up the hospital and say somebody's not feeling too well today. We don't see him. We don't see him with our eyes. Um, But let's not think that we have to see God to enjoy him. The Bible says he's spirit, right? So yes, there will come a day when Jesus returns and we'll see him in new light. We'll spend eternity getting to know him as we'll talk about in a moment. But let's not think that we have to see God to enjoy him. And you know how I know that? Because we actually find it difficult to enjoy the people we do see. (laughs) You know, we have difficulty getting on with the people that we see, let, let, let alone enjoying them. You know, John said that if you don't love your brother who you do see, how can you love God who you don't see? (laughs) So you don't have to see God to enjoy him. 
I think of uh, Doubting Thomas, you know, Doubting Thomas. Jesus appears to the, uh, the disciples in his resurrected form. He hasn't ascended yet. He's appearing to people. And he appears before them and Thomas wasn't there and he's full of doubt. What are you talking about? Jesus is alive. He, he, he died on the cross. We saw that. And so he comes, brought before Jesus, comes before Jesus and Jesus said, look at my side, put your hand there, look at my wrist. And the moment Thomas did that, he said, my Lord and my God. And then Jesus said something quite profound. He said, blessed are those who see and believe. Um, he, no, he said, Thomas, you're blessed because you see and believe. Blessed are those who don't see and believe. Hallelujah. So it is completely logical and rational and reasonable for us to learn to enjoy God, the God whom we don't see. Secondly, the challenge we face is that we only see in part in this age in which we live. Come with me, please, to 2 Corinthians chapter 12. Might as well get into the Bible tonight. That'd be good. 2 Corinthians chapter 12. And verse chapter, no, 1 Corinthians 13, sorry. 1 Corinthians chapter 13 and verse 12. It simply says this, that now we see a poor reflection as in a mirror, then we shall see face to face. Now I know in part, then I shall know fully, even as I am fully known. So it's actually really talking about a, re a revelation of ourselves, but I, I think that it, it's deeper than that because it says I shall know fully, even as I am fully known. So God fully knows me, and when I see him, I'll fully know. But what it points out is that we see in a glass darkly or dimly, as the King James Verge Version puts it. So we see in part. And what it reminds me of is that um, coming to know God and coming to enjoy him is a journey, isn't it? And it's actually an adventurous journey and an exciting journey. That, and, and you think of the possibilities of getting to know God more and more. And I think that's quite exciting. And you know what? Even, at the, even when Jesus comes and we see him in all of his glory and his splendor, we have a fresh vision of God. We see God, the Son of Man, the Son of God coming to earth. Even though we see him, we'll still spend an eternity getting to know an eternal God. Hallelujah. I think that's quite exciting. That tells me heaven's not going to be boring. The new creation's not boring. The new earth's not boring. We'll spend eternity discovering and learning. Isn't that an awesome? So, Tony, you're not going to sit on a cloud with a little harp forever. How boring is that? <laughs> it might be nice for a while. By the way, have you been practicing your harp? <laughs> Steve's going to be on the drum kit. There's a special room in heaven for the drummers. <laughs> it's a soundproof room. <laughs> So this, this idea, you know, the reality is that this side of the new age to come, we're only seeing dimly. However, it's an ever, um, it's an ever brightening vision. Um, the path of the just is as a shining light. It shineth more and more until that perfect age. Friends, I want to tell you tonight that if you're communing with God and fellowshipping with him consistently daily and you're getting to know him as best you can, you're absorbing the word, which we'll talk about in a minute, you're truly trying to walk with God, then, then your light will shine brighter towards that day and you'll get a clearer picture of him and your relationship will become deeper and more intimate. And I think that's exciting. But we need to respond to God, amen? It's a bit like marriage. It's a two-way thing, right? It's a relational thing. And, and if we're just doing our own thing and neglecting our fellowship with God, then how can we get to know him? But I think it's exciting to know that we can get to know him deeper and deeper and enjoy him more and more as we move along in our relationship with God. Hallelujah. The third thing is that our own blindness hinders us, and it's related to the previous thing. Come with me to Ephesians chapter 1. Ephesians chapter 1. G'day, Sonia. G'day, uh, Taylor. Come on in. Ephesians chapter 1 
And I love this. This is one of my favourite passages in the Bible. And Paul is praying for the... He's telling them that this is what he's praying for them. And in verse 15, he says, For this reason, ever since I heard about your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love for all the saints, I've not stopped giving thanks for you, remembering you in my prayers. I keep asking that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the glorious Father, may give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation. Turn to the person next to you, wake them up and say, Revelation. That's what we need. Amen. How is it that we can walk through life and not see God? Then all of a sudden, boom, our hearts are open. Holy Spirit opens our hearts to see God. And it's always in response to the gospel. Now, now I've heard of people having visions of God and and having um, God visit them in some way. I've heard of people in Muslim countries having visions of Jesus. And God has ways of getting through to people, but ultimately it will lead to a revelation of the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ, and then coming to know God through him. So he prays for a spirit of wisdom and revelation so that you may know know him better. In verse 18, he says, I pray also that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened in order that you may know the hope to which he has called you, the riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints and his incomparable great power to us who believe. Hallelujah. He says, I pray that the eyes of your heart might be enlightened. I actually think that's one of the best prayers we can pray for ourselves and for others. God, open my heart to see more and more because you know what? I reckon that if we pray that prayer, even though we see in a glass darkly and dimly, and even though our own lack of ability to see is is very real, I reckon over time the focus and the vision can become sharper. A bit like a camera lens. Have you looked through one of those? Who's got binoculars at home? Anybody? Yeah. yeah. You've got to kind of use the little thing on the top there and get it in focus. Out of that blurry sort of, oh, I can't quite see that. All of a sudden, boom, you've got it clear as a bell. And it's the same thing with cameras, that our vision can become clearer over time. But we must pray for that spirit of revelation and and wisdom and that God would open our hearts. Now, this is not a knowledge that is kind of um, extra biblical. It's not a secret kind of knowledge, right, or knowing. It's all in the pages of that book. And that's why we really must get into the word. That's why God's given us this book. This is the God-breathed word. The more we can absorb this book, the more we get to know God. And the Holy Spirit gets onto that. He quickens it to our hearts. I was just reading through Galatians in my daily reading. And uh, I just, I was just so blessed because I'd read this verse hundreds of times, maybe thousands of times in the course of the many years I've been in Christ. And I was reading this verse in verse 20 of chapter 2. And it says, I have been crucified with Christ and I no longer live but Christ lives in me. The life I now live in the body, I live by the faith of the Son of God. And as I was reading, I was slowing down in my reading. I live by the faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. And when I read that, I just started weeping. I'd read it hundreds of times and not cried. And I started reading, I was reading it and I started weeping. And it was like, it's just like a, a healing balm went over my spirit that God would love me so much and Jesus gave himself for me. And it was like a deeper knowing that I hadn't experienced before. And as we spend time in the word, God can do that. Now, I don't have that every time I read the word, but occasionally the Holy Spirit just zaps you. The Holy Spirit just comes over you or wells up within you. And you start to see things more clearly. The lens gets sharpened. The vision becomes clearer. The revelation becomes deeper. And suddenly you know that 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 God loves you. That's why fellowship is so important, as Roger said earlier. Communion with God. I don't know whether you were around in the 1970s. Taylor, you won't understand this at all. And Steve won't either. He's still only, what are you, 23? <laughs> well, it was 32, was it? <laughs> and the rest. Oh, mate, you're getting old. He's getting old, not, not us. Hey, um, 
In the 1970s, there was this dishwashing. No, sorry, it was a toothpaste ad. <clears throat> and they talked about how this toothpaste would sort of get into your enamel. And I can't remember the name of the toothpaste. I'm sorry, I can't remember that. Colgate, yeah. And they'd get a piece of white chalk and they'd soak it in blue dye. And they'd go about half, they'd just go in a little way. And then they'd go a bit further in and said, that's what this stuff does. And so everybody's buying Colgate because it gets in, right? What a great picture. Mind you, that was when colour televisions came out in the 19th century. Remember that? It was like a revolution. Everybody was down to the Harvey Normans of the day and they were getting their credit cards out and we're going to have a colour TV. My dad actually worked for Retrovision in Bathurst at the time, which is one of those white goods type stores and uh, televisions and what have you and... Uh, and he sold hundreds of these things very quickly. Everybody was getting colour TVs and so seriously, it was amazing. You'd see this chalk go in and you'd put the piece of chalk into the blue dye and they'd pull it out and there's the blue stain remaining. You say, well, that's like the Colgate toothpaste getting into the enamel. And you know what I reckon? The more you get into the Word of God, the more you commune with Jesus in prayer and in fellowship on a daily basis and even throughout the day, but especially with those intimate times alone with God at night or in the morning. As you do that and get into the Word over time, the Holy Spirit, it's like soaking you in the Word more. And it gets deeper into your spirit. And you know what? That's what people need. Hallelujah. You know, the Bible says of itself that the Word of God is living and active. It's like a double-edged sword that cuts through. And we need that because without that, you, you, you can give your life to Jesus and go to heaven and you have some knowledge of him, but what an exciting thing to know that we can get to know God more deeply, more intimately, more thoroughly, and we can get to know him in ways in which we can enjoy him more and more. Hallelujah. Because that's what the kingdom coming is all about. Enjoying God forever. Hallelujah. Do you want to enjoy God? I don't want to be bored in my relationship with Jesus. I want to enjoy God. Hallelujah. We could talk a lot more about that. The other thing that gets in the way is our fear and shame. And we've already talked about that tonight, where Adam hid. And when we sin deliberately, we want to hide from God and we feel the shame of that. And so we need to confess our sins and receive the cleansing. It can get in the way. Romans 8 verse 15. It can rob us of enjoying God when we deliberately sin. And I've got to tell you, if you've got sin in your life and you know it, obviously you've got to do your best and do your utmost to come to God and say, God, help me to get rid of that. But you're carrying a weight in your life that will, will hinder your relationship with God. He still loves you. He still thinks you're fantastic, but he, he must judge sin. And so in Romans 8 of chapter, of, in chapter 8, verse um, 15, it says, For you did not receive a spirit that makes you a slave again to fear, but you received the spirit of sonship, and by him we cry, Abba, Father. We know that that Aramaic word, I think it is uh, Abba. Aramaic for Abba means daddy. Now that's not a casual kind of daddy, that's a respectful daddy. And what it's really saying is that this is an intimate word. And Jesus used that word. And this would have shocked those people because they hadn't heard God referred to like that. Not that I'm aware of. Maybe you could correct me if you've seen that in the Bible. But this was Jesus saying this is what it's going to be like where we can come to our loving Heavenly Father. The Papua New Guineans call him Papa Daddy God. <laughs> and uh, what an extraordinary thing that we can have that level of intimacy. Praise the Lord. So we've got to deal with our sin. We've got to realise that that if we're deliberately sinning, that can really weigh on you and it can hinder your relationship with the Lord. So by hook or by crook, get that out of your life. Jesus said, if your right hand sins, cut it off. If your eye causes you to sin, poke it out. Now, he wasn't saying literally do that, <laughs> all right, obviously. But he's saying just go to whatever it, do whatever it takes to get that out of your life and get counselling, get help, get prayer, confess your sins, get it out of your life because it's, It'll rob you of your enjoyment of your relationship with God. And, of course, um, Paul in Galatians says, what a man sows, he reaps. So God is not mocked. 
He doesn't turn a blind eye. (laughs) He wants us to deal with that because his son paid for it on the cross. Now, the other part of that is that when you sin, you can be forgiven. Amen? (laughs) And that he can deliver us from that shame and that guilt. Our deliberate sin can rob us. And the Bible says repent. You know, when you deliberately sin, you turn your back on God. Have you ever had anybody turn their back on you? It's not much fun, hey? It's one of the worst things you can do, one of the most insulting and degrading to just turn your back on somebody. Jesus never turns his back on us. In fact, he just spread out his arms and says, I'm doing this for you. He was facing us with all of his love. And so when we look at sin like that, that it's turning our back on God, then repentance is about facing and turning to him again and realizing that we totally need him and his forgiveness. And once again, receiving his his love and his favor through what he did on the cross. John Piper, who's a famous American pastor, said this. Let me find it. God is most glorified when we are most satisfied in him. God is most glorified when we're most satisfied in him. And isn't it true that humans try to find satisfaction in everything else, in all the created things except God? And there are things that God can satisfy and only he can satisfy that we try to get in all these other ways. And that always comes up short. People try to get it through consumerism. But you've got to keep getting more of it because it wears off quick. Isn't that right? I was uh, watching some program, How Are We Going For Time, um, about billionaires, yachts. <laughs> That's another world, isn't it? And this guy had a $30 million yacht and he just didn't like that anymore so he bought a $60 million yacht. It's a drug. And yet we try to anaesthetise, we try to fill the void in our hearts with all the created things when all the time there is a creator who can satisfy our deepest needs. And he does give us things to enjoy. Don't make any mistake about that. He says he freely gives us things to enjoy but if they're a replacement for God, you've got a problem. It becomes an idol. And so that's why when Jesus had that encounter with the Samaritan woman at the well, he said, I give you water that when you drink it, you'll never thirst again. And he'll give you water that wells up to eternal life. That's a quality of life that completely and utterly satisfied. Hallelujah. I think one of the greatest statements in the Bible, and we close on this, almost, one more thing after this, And that is when Jesus turned to the disciples and he says, I no longer call you servants, I call you friends. That's why Jesus went to the cross. We were enemies of God and Jesus won back the friendship. Hallelujah. Something we couldn't do, as Roger pointed out earlier. I want to close with that thought again that, you know what? We can enjoy God because he enjoys us. Amen. Let's close in prayer. Father, we thank you for our time together and worship. Yes, there's expressions of worship that we engage in weekly and and corporately and privately. But Lord, we thank you that um, as we do, it's about communion with you, it's about loving on you, and it's about enjoying you. And Lord, you want us to be set free from those idols of this world and the things that we try to get our fulfillment in that don't fully satisfy. And you want us to find our satisfaction in you and you alone. We thank you, Jesus, that you're more than enough for us. And whilst we might enjoy a good meal or we might enjoy a good moment with a friend, we might enjoy a holiday or we might enjoy that new purchase, we know that those things are temporal. They don't satisfy the deepest spiritual needs of our heart. And they certainly make poor substitutes for you. So, Lord, we turn our hearts to you tonight. We want to honour you and worship you with all that is within us. We want you to know that we realise that only you can quench the thirst of our souls. 
And Lord, we turn to you and we want to love you. And we thank you, Father, that we can enjoy you and we can grow in our faith. We can grow in our relationship with you over time as we absorb your word and as your Holy Spirit ministers to our hearts through intimate fellowship and communion. We thank you that as we do that, we'll learn to enjoy you more and more. Father, I thank you for your blessing on each one of us as we go into this next week. You'd help us to be mindful of these things and to make sure that we have that personal time with you, an intimate time each day. And, and Lord, even through the day, help us to pause for a moment and pray and to enjoy your company because we know that you enjoy us. Thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Praise God. Just sit silently for a moment. No, with Debbie playing. Just listening to the beautiful rain on this tin roof. Bible talks about the latter rain. This world needs the rain of God. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for your love for us. Thank you for your peace filling our hearts now. Thank you that your grace is sufficient for us. Thank you for the presence of the Holy Spirit with us always. Hallelujah. As Roger shared earlier, help us not to be like Martha, all anxious and worried about this and that. Help us to rest in your presence draw from you and learn from you, to walk with you. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Father. Praise God. Well, I think I'm going to finish there, folks. So God bless you. Enjoy some fellowship. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for the presence of the Holy Spirit. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you that you love us with an everlasting love. Thank you, Lord. You loved us and gave yourself up for us.